Yeah, it's always interesting when, like, you have a medical doctor that, like, you talk about these ideas with. And, like, I had two of them. One's a surgeon, an OBGYN, and the other one's a hospitalist and a neurologist, too. And it's like when you explain these ideas in those terms, Good night, everybody. Good night. They, they agree with you 100%, right? Like, it's, you realize you don't have as many differences as you think you do. Like, when you put together a cogent, logical argument, like, there's very few people that are going to be like, no, that's, that's just dead wrong. Right, like, and that's that's part of the nature of of trying to communicate interprofessionally with with other professions in general. Like, we get so caught up in our own ideologies and our own lenses that we're incapable of communicating them in a way that other like you have to speak the other language too. Right, that's one of the reasons why I'm actually not a fan of the original naturopathic language because I don't feel like it does any service for us in the real world. Like, you're not going to talk about you know uh, I don't even remember the terms anymore. I took the boards and passed them. Um, yeah, the. You have a dextro, yeah. dextro, sino, yeah. you know, you're not going to talk to a surgeon like that, right? Like, you need to speak their language. So you have to be able to terms in top of Yeah, or a patient, yeah. It, simplistically for a patient or in structural or histological terms for, for a doctor. Like, when I explain how a reflex works, you know, I, I click their kneecap and their leg kicks out, and then I do it on their neck and they get full range, and then I explain the mechanism of how I'm just firing that reflex over and over again so it tricks the muscle into not knowing its length, and they go, oh, that makes perfect sense. And what do you know? They all refer all their patients into me. Like, you know, I've got the top neurosurgeon in the state coming to see me. I've got the top cardiologist in the state that comes and sees me. Neurologists, I mean, you name it, right? And even the neurologists are, are scared to death of cervical manipulations. So of course, I would never manipulate their neck right? in a million years. I mean, I don't do it that often anyway, only when somebody asks for it, generally speaking. Or when you're making a video. Yeah, when I'm doing it for the gram. And yeah. <laughs> it's all about the gram. And it's all about the clicks, right? Yeah. Sell out. Yeah. Sell out, me too. Yeah, a million views. You didn't get more Are than a thousand likes. Was it really a good segment? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. All right, so upper extremity biomechanics. So the bones of the upper extremity, we're talking the humerus, the ulna, the radius, the carpal bones, the metacarpal bones, and the phalanges. I don't think that's how you spell phalanges. Yeah. Joints of the upper extremity, we have the elbow. So at the elbow, we actually have two specific joints. We have the radial ulnar and the humeral ulnar. So that would be the true elbow for where the olecranon is. But then you also have the radial ulnar joint, right? So everybody stick your arm out like that in anatomical position. So here's our ulna, here's our radius. The interesting thing about human forearms is when I turn this over, my bones are now crossed. They create an X. My ulna is now here and here. My radius is now here and here. So our analogous structures in our lower body, the fibula and tibia, don't do that. So it's a very unique thing that we have here with this pronation, supination motion. So if you have improper pronation or supination, whether it be because one of the muscles is too tight or you're structurally compromised or whatever else, it can certainly affect the wrist and the shoulder because you're going to compensate with inappropriate movement to make the elbow do what it's supposed to do. So the motion at the radial ulnar joint is pronation, supination. The motion at the humeral ulnar joint is extension and flexion. And you can have combinations in those movements. So like the biceps brachii, for example, which does not attach to the humerus at any point, right? It's free-floating. You can grab it and move it. So everybody grab your arm right now and move your bicep around. It's not attached to your humerus at all. Okay. It attaches where? The coracoid process, and then inside the shoulder joint, and then a common insertion on what bone? The, the ulnar or the radius? Yes. Yeah. All right. So, so when you supinate, right, the bicep is going to bring that bone over. So if you pay attention, there's, there's a combined motion there. Right? So you're going to feel your, your supinator, which lies across the elbow here, and then you have your pronator teres, your pronator quadratus. So the two muscles that are going to supinate are the biceps brachii and the supinator. The muscles that pronate primarily are going to be the pronator teres and the pronator quadratus. Um, some will argue that there is some component to the brachioradialis as well, and even some from the, the wrist flexors, if the wrist is in a flex position and you get some contraction. Um, I'm not so sure about that. So the elbow. The elbow is described as a, tr as a trochoginglymoid joint. <laughs> so that's his actual classification. Uh, that will not be a test question. It possesses two degrees of freedom or motion, flexion, extension, and supination, pronation, and sometimes a combination of those two things. So they can happen simultaneously too, right? You can do them isolated-wise, but you can also do them simultaneously. The articular components include the trochlea and the capitulum on the medial and lateral aspects of the distal humerus, 
and distally the upper end of the ulna and the head of the radius. Okay. So the, the radius is going to articulate with the scaphoid bone primarily, and the ulna sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't create a joint with the pisiform and the lunate, but there is a connection there between cartilage and connective tissue. So it does, it's not actually a joint, but they are connected, so they can pull on each other. So a lot of times people, if they're having wrist pain, it could be a, a byproduct of poor pronation supination, or it could be a problem with the carrying angle. So the carrying angle is named that way for carrying things by your side. So a lot of people don't realize this, but, but hyperextension of the elbow and the knee is a secondary sex characteristic of females. Just like breast tissue, just like wider hips. So everybody extend your elbows all the way right now. All the way. So we have one hyperextender, two, no, one. You, you're not getting all the way up? Like straight? Like as far as you can go. Yeah, so she's not really a hyperextender. You are, though. Uh, and, and most females are. Okay. So when they, like, here's a problem with, like, ACL repair. Like, because they hyperextend on one side, they'll have the repair, and they'll actually have full extension, but it'll feel off to them, and their mechanics are off because they've moved too much on the other side relative to, to normal extension. So you almost, in order to get equality between the two and not throw out their hips, you need equal hyperextension, which is potentially problematic. We actually think that might be part of the reason why the ACL and PCL are susceptible too is because of that secondary sex characteristic of hyperextensibility. It puts more torque on the ligaments because they're going through a greater range of motion. So one of the reasons why females have a greater carrying angle as well is because they have a greater Q angle. So the wider the hips are, biologically, if you're going to carry a jug or something by your side and your arm didn't go out wide enough, you would hit it against your leg and spill. Right. Do we need our ACL? I mean... Yes, generally. <laughs> What's I mean, the purpose I've heard of articles the... like saying that we don't need our ACL and that we can function just as normal without it. I'm not sure how. That's going to lead to massive joint degeneration. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're asking for a, a knee replacement at that point. All that extra movement going on in there. Because mm -hmm. then what happens is your, your joint capsule itself and the meniscus has to, to manage all the tension. So you, you don't really engage your ACL or PCL if your muscles are firing, right? But as soon as they stop firing or you stop the bone on the other end and you don't have any check there, then there's going to be movement. So theoretically, you could walk around with a torn ACL, um, but you can't really change directions. And then you're susceptible, if you're not paying attention, if something hits you, of completely damaging the joint. You need your ACL more than any other ligament in the knee. You need your PCL somewhat less. You need your LCL and, and MCL significantly less than those other two, LCL being the least amount necessary of the group. You also have a common synergist there on the LCL side, like the uh, hamstring and the IT band, and some of the fibrotic tissue there that can also take over some of the role of the LCL, or the fibular collateral ligament. So it attaches on the fibula, but we also know that the biceps femoris does as well. So, by, by the way, you can have a functional problem there too, like if you have a torn LCL, so you don't have the check there on the movement of the head of the fibula, you don't have a, a secondary check, it's not uncommon to see the bicep femoris when it engages sublux that fibular head posteriorly. Or if you have a history of a torn LCL, it may not actively be torn, it may just be lax from before, but you're more susceptible to posterior movement of your fibular head, which can cause peroneal neuritis, it can cause calf pain, and it can cause altered biomechanics in general, just like all bony displacements can. So like if your humerus isn't all the way in the socket, you're going to have a tight pec major, a tight lat, all these other muscles are going to compensate so you can still function, but then you also have to address those muscles as well. Like if your shoulder isn't working well, what you're going to do is you're going to use your, your trap and your levator scap to get that shoulder up to where you can get to the point where you can engage your deltoid or use it. But as a consequence of that is you get the overuse of the levator scap and trap. Over time, now we've got a synergistic problem there as well because we're going to have neck pain and, and dysfunction there and cervicogenic headaches. What would this... Hello. Hi. Right here. What would that be a problem with right there? Oh. Is that you? No. One of, one of the training partners. He's like, can you help me out? I was like, it looks like MCL and possibly like ACL too. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty intense, right? Now, now he could just have a connective tissue difference, right? Like some people are just hypermobile. Yeah. And unfortunately, like what happens oftentimes is they use it as a party trick when they're younger. Yeah. In hypermobility, while it doesn't hurt them originally, eventually you start to wear out the joint capsule itself, and then you're going to need a joint replacement. 
So a lot of people will show off their party tricks of being able to dislocate bones, but what happens over time is they make the ligaments lax, the joint capsule lax, and then they're actually going to be hurting later on. I was going to ask what, um, so I understand with the, the hyperextension with the carrying angle, but what about the knees? What would be the biological purpose of that? Not really sure. The hyperextension isn't actually a biological purpose either. It just may come with it. It may come because of the carrying angle. I'm not really sure. It could be have to do with the elasticity of the tissue, maybe even the shape of the electron. I'd have to look it up. I'm not, I'm not really sure. You know, it's like body hair for men. Like, you know, why why do we really need more body? Well, we don't necessarily need more. It's just a byproduct of just testosterone. Mm-hmm. So some of this stuff could be a byproduct of progesterone or estrogen. I mean, I don't really know. Um, just like a relaxin, you know. Yeah, yeah, or prolactin, or you know, yeah. I mean, and that's why the pelvis is generally wider too, right? So there's more space for for childbirth. Like men are going to have a very difficult time birthing children with such a narrow pelvis. It's it's not good for that. Which has yeah, right. <laughs> Which has real world consequences as far as like athletics. That's why men are generally faster. On top of the fact that there's more dense muscles, but the the more narrow pelvis leads you to linear power and linear straightness. Yeah. Also, our leg length to waist ratio is generally higher, too, which makes you faster. So what they found in a lot of, like, New World African-American runners is they have a shorter torso relative to their leg length. So it basically tips their upper body forward more, so they're, they're already moving forward in a, in a faster fashion. And that may be part of the reason why they do better in the 100 meters or 40 meters or whatever else, is that is the shorter torso and longer legs. Um, and there's a lot of, like we talked about last time, there's a lot of genetic differences, too. We talked about the people in Kenya um, who, like, every person in their village can beat every other runner in the world because they have so much more mitochondria and red blood cells. They just, they can transfer oxygen everywhere. Well, those people also are not very good at building skeletal muscle as far as, like, strength and powerlifting. Like, if you look at the build, like, northern Europeans are the strongest people. Like, Icelanders and, and um, Danish people. They have big barrel chests. They're not ripped, but they're usually winning the world's strongest man, and they're usually doing very well in powerlifting. Um, and you can look across sports. Some of that's cultural, but some of it's probably biological as well. There's actually a theory being floated that, that natives and Asians carry more subcutaneous fat, which makes them float better, so they end up being better swimmers. Yeah. So, like, there's a lot of different reasons why you see domination. Some of it cultural, of course, because certain cultures put more emphasis into certain sports and things like that, but some of it may just be a, a, a predisposition, like, like we talked about with the Kenyans. Like, it's not like they have these massive resources to be pouring into a, a running program or it makes them money. Now, it can certainly change their life if they can get to the United States or the U.K., you know, and be able to run for colleges or get scholarships. Like, you know, that's certainly a lot different than sub-Saharan Africa, where the literacy rate can be below 50%, and, you know, the, the rate of uh, malaria and HIV, I mean, it's, life ain't easy over there. Anyway, the elbow. <laughs> 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 As you guys are starting to get a handle of my lecture styles. All right, so <laughs> so we're looking at the humerus here, so we can see the UCL, the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, so the ulnar collateral ligament is the ligament that's associated with Tommy John surgery. So it's the ligament that's usually damaged in baseball players in particular, sometimes quarterbacks, but you can also just have a slip and fall. Like I'll see this in grapplers often, like they get taken down and they post the arm out, which you're not really supposed to do, but what happens is all that force causes this ligament to tear and they get a full almost a dislocation of it, right? So, you, so keep in mind, you, you cannot dislocate a joint without damaging some tissue around it, whether it's ligament or labrum or capsule or whatever else. Like, there's no free lunch with that. If you dislocate a joint, there's also secondary disruption. So they may need prolotherapy injections to tighten up the ligaments. You know, they, they may need some other forms of therapy. Um, but you also have to make sure there isn't bone chips or fragments or things like that, which you will see with things like arm bars. Um, you know, if they're feeling a bony end plate at some point, even after a, a period of time, which you may be seeing are bone fragments and that need to be removed arthroscopically. If they don't, those bone fragments can roll around in there and grind everything up and they end up with something called cauliflower elbow, um, which basically destroys all the cartilage in there. And they're not very good at elbow replacements. What about, so I have some of my bones on my PSIS are chipped from skateboarding and falling back on it. And so I have fragments, you know, going around that general area. Is that, could that be a risk factor? Probably not because it's not around a joint itself. Okay. Um, SI joint or anything like that? Like yeah, I doubt it's in your SI joint. Okay. SI joint's pretty compact. It's, it's more, you're thinking the, like the knee, the hip, the elbow, the shoulder. 
are analogous, you know, quadruped uh, joints, which should have been weight-bearing joints. Like, even though your SI joint is a weight-bearing joint, it's kind of a secondary weight. It's a weight distribution joint more than a weight-bearing joint. It allows distribution between the pelvis and the spine, whereas your hips are actually holding the majority of the weight. All right, so looking right here, we can see the ulnar nerve. So it goes through what tunnel? Two names? The cubital tunnel. Okay. Anybody know the other one? I mess with you. There's only one name for it. He's like, I took this class already. What's the other one? All right, and, and here we can see the median nerve and the brachial artery. So these are the three or four most important structures here in the forearm. So keep that in mind. Like if you have a puncture wound or, or something like that, um, the brachial artery, if your brachial artery is severed, you're likely going to die. The amount of blood pressure going through the brachial artery and the femoral artery and the aorta, um, blood will literally squirt out. Anybody ever seen somebody with an artery severed? It's pretty crazy. Blood literally goes out at your heart rate. Yeah. Like if you don't get it closed up, like you'll bleed out and die. Yeah, yeah, yep, until you get it sewed up, sutured up. So, yeah, I mean, you're, you're going to go into shock. You'll lose consciousness because when you don't have enough blood, you don't have enough oxygen for your brain. You don't have enough blood sugar as well, and then you can certainly die. So, like, these are the movies you see where they, somebody has, like, a, a glass, a piece of glass, and they cut somebody's arm right here. It's certainly enough to kill you. Now, keep in mind, arteries are very deep. So veins are superficial, capillary is the most superficial. It's very hard to get on an artery, except for in the most superficial areas. And generally those areas are where we take pulses. So the femoral triangle is the most risky, right? Um, at your wrist is a very vulnerable area for the brachial artery. So glass falls and stuff like that, you can certainly see ruptures there. And then in the front of the neck, we have our carotids and our vertebral arteries. Most other arteries in the body are fairly deep. So if you can feel a pulse on it, it's usually a more superficial one. Keep in mind, you only feel pulses on arteries. You don't feel them on veins. What's the risk for jiu-jitsu, you know, in other combat sports when you're talking about the arteries in the neck and getting your neck cranked? And... We don't really have a statistic on it. It hasn't been studied. There are several cases of, <clears throat> of stroke that have been reported in the literature from jiu-jitsu. Um, logically, you could say that it's probably less, it's probably more dangerous than manipulation. Um, but it also depends on who you're talking about, right? Like the demographics. Like if we took somebody who's 60 and, and did that to them, we're going to be looking at a much higher risk. Um, as we know, uh, structures can become more brittle with age, particularly if we don't keep them elastic. So like one of the problems with arthrosclerosis, one of the reasons why exercise is so helpful is it keeps elasticity in our arteries and veins because the increases and decreases in blood pressure stretch those tissues out. Otherwise, they can harden, they can get calcium within them, they can get uh, placking on the walls. So then what happens is if we have placking on the walls and then we start to crank it, we, you may not damage the artery, you may, but more than likely you're going to break off a plaque, which causes a stroke. And almost all, very few strokes are caused by ver, uh, arter, arterial damage. Like most of them are caused by plaques that break free. Um... You know, it's kind of ironic that, that you know, they talk about um, the anterior cor uh, coronary artery that gives the heart blood supply. It's this tiny little artery. So the, the organ that gives your entire body blood has this one little area that gets blood to it from itself. So when it gets blocked, all of a sudden the blood doesn't have, the heart doesn't have blood. Like, what? That's a heart attack? The heart doesn't get blood? But it's full of blood. Well, yeah, on the inside, but it doesn't actually get it to the epicardium and, and the cardiac tissues. It's, it's a trick, right? Stupid evolutionary flaw. But our brain has the... Um, circle of Willis. Circle of Willis. So there's not a backup mechanism for the heart? Um, no. And keep in mind, some people have incomplete circle of Willis's. It's actually fairly common. Really? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Like not, not connected? Yep, not connected. Mm -hmm. so, so they're at a higher risk, right? Yeah. Of ischemia, of, you know. And it's more ischemic stroke than hemorrhagic stroke is the problem there. You guys know the difference, right? Ischemia means you're not getting blood supply to it. Hemorrhagic means you're bleeding. You're actively bleeding. Um, and, and the biggest stroke risk, you, by far the biggest stroke risk you guys are going to see in practice is deep vein thrombosis, right? So you will see them in your practice. Make sure they're not foam rolling. Like if somebody has calf pain, you have to quantify and make sure that they don't have warmth, that you can feel a pulse. And you can, so one thing I'll even do sometimes, is I'll just check blood pressure from calf to calf. Discoloration. Yeah, discoloration. 
Heat is usually one of your biggest indicators and pinpoint burning pain. So if that's the case, they have to get on blood thinners, correct? To try to break that up. But if you push on that area, you, you risk dislodging it. And where does it go? Lungs. So that's a pulmonary embolism, which can be fatal. You need to kind of know their, their complaint, right? Uh -huh. Like if they have calf issues, you know, you might not do it until you get the okay by somebody else. Yeah. I had a talk with mine the other day, too, about like just cupping everybody's calves without actually checking first. Yeah. It's kind of risky. Yeah. When, take, a, take a little bit of a history. It, it felt like, um, you know, when you're a kid mm -hmm. and you have growing pains, like your bones hurt, that really deep ache, that was how my DVD felt. Yeah. And so getting that kind of information from people is really important because it won't feel like the calf strain. It doesn't feel like that, right? It's not in the calf. It's right. Deeper. Right. But they'll still point to that area. So if your mind is on muscles, then you may start treating the calf, assuming that it's the calf, right? Like, but, but it's deeper than that. And it may not even be the calf. Mine was my iliac. Mine was, yeah. mine was way up yeah. here. Yeah. That's actually fairly common as well. Yeah. The most common is, is in the calf, in the saphenous vein. But um, that's another very common area. And do you guys, what's the mnemonic for it? The, the, it's the four Fs, right? Fat female 40 fertile? What about flight? Is that part of it now? No. So females are more likely to have it. Um, being fertile makes you more likely to have it. Um, one of the biggest risk factors is uh, um, what you call drugs. Um, birth control, birth control pills, pills and smoking. And smoking. Um, and being obese, so having poor vascular return. So the, that's your, you know, the combination of all those things is, again, your wheelhouse, because we're talking triangulation, right? Like, just one of those things, okay, it still might, but it's less likely. When you start combining smoking and being on birth control and being overweight, so, again, generally, like, one of those things is synonymous with the other, right? Like, men usually aren't on birth control. <laughs> I know they're working on it, but... <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean the men can't have it, and one of, the, one of the fallacies you'll run into is thinking only women have it, and then you'll run into a man that has it, just like men get breast cancer. Just because it doesn't usually happen, people will ignore it, but it's just as fatal. Okay, so elbow and arm anatomy. So the lateral epicondyle, the epicondyle is on what bone? It's on the humerus. Okay, so sometimes for whatever reason, people start pressing around on the radial head and calling that the epicondyle. It's not the epicondyle. How can you tell by the gap in between the two? Yeah, it, but it's above the elbow. Yeah. If you have them bend their elbow, the prominence there is where it is. Okay. So the elbow and arm anatomy. We have we have uh, two extensor groups of the, the tri of the elbow itself. So the triceps group and then the anconius. So the triceps, as by its given name, has three heads: the long head, the medial head, and the lateral head. The long head is the only head that crosses the shoulder joint, so it is also a shoulder extensor. The lateral and medial head do not extend the shoulder. They only extend the elbow. Everybody follow? So the long head of the tricep can also be a limiting factor in shoulder issues as well. If your long head of the tricep is very tight, it could also limit your ability to abduct. Okay. Uh, flexion of the arm, we have the brachialis, you have the biceps brachii, you have the brachioradialis. Those are our primary flexors. The brachialis is the only one that is an actual pure flexor only. Brachialis? The brachialis. It lies between the lateral head of your tricep and the biceps brachii. So if you take your fingertips right there, you can feel it. It's usually pretty sensitive. There's a bump between the lateral head of your tricep and your bicep. Everybody feel it? So that's a true flexor. So the way you strengthen that, you can do hammer curls, you can do reverse curls. But any kind of supination will take the load off of the brachialis and put it on the biceps brachii. So if you want to work the long head of your tricep, push downs aren't enough. You have to actually be extending your shoulder as well. So you would be doing overhead presses like this or presses like this. That way you're extended at the shoulder as well. And just like we talked about with like glute engagement, like when you take out a synergistic group, you only have the, the muscle that you want to fire. So say you wanted somebody to, to fire their tricep, right? If you fire your rear delt all the way here and then extend, the only thing you can engage is your long head of your tricep. But if you try to engage it from here, you'll get synergistic activation of the rear delt and tricep, and you won't isolate your tricep. Just like we talked about with the spinal extensors and the glutes. 
Like if your spine is still flexed, you have the ability to create extension there, so inner erectors, and then your glutes will engage as well, but you won't get pure activation of your glutes. So if you're trying to isolate certain muscles for corrective exercise, one of the best ways to do that is to take out the synergistic group. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we take advantage of those kinetic chains. Kind of like the thing I did with the wrist extension and the wrist flexion, where you break somebody's elbow down. So by, by flexing their arm there, it engages their wrist flexors, which also engages their bicep, which starts the preloading of the bending of the elbows. When I push here, nobody can resist me. When I have them extend their wrist all the way, it preloads the kinetic chain of the extensors of the elbow and of the wrist, so I'm preloaded in the locked down position, and nobody can break that hold. And there's multiple systems in the body where you can take advantage of those kinetic chains. In fact, a lot of them work with, like, your body, right? Like, when you turn your head this direction, it has a multiple neurological effects on your multifidi muscles, on your opposite trap. Um, it can even affect your opposite shoulder, too. And then through a, a proprioceptive input, it could potentially affect your hips or, you know, whatever else. Elbow motion. So we have the ligaments that basically check motion, right? Uh, we have the ulnohumeral articulation, the anterior bundle of the MCL. So the MCL is going to be on the medial part, uh, portion, or the, and that's synonymous with the UCL. So you can use MCL and UCL synonymously. You also have your lateral collateral ligament, which is going to attach what two bones, generally speaking? Think about anatomical position. The radius and humerus. But it's not nearly as rigid of a ligament because it has to allow for pronation of the, of the radius. Okay. The radiocapitular articulation, the common flexor tendon, the extensor tendon, and the capsule. Um, so those are all in the anterior portion. So that's all going to be on the front of the, the um, arm there. Um, you can also see the brachiocephalic vein. It's going to go right from there all the way up into here. So that's the vein that you know, you're going to get bl um, blood drawn from. Um, it's very prominent in most people. And if you want to see a difference in genetic variation from even just ourselves to ourselves, look at the vein architecture from one arm to the other. Like usually our veins don't have the same shape from side to side. And we're the same genetic person. So veins are much different from person to person, just like superficial nerves and just like muscles are. Again, textbooks are nice, and they give us a general idea to start from, but again, we're, we're very unique as well. Even in the forearm, too. So a fun little test. Let's see if everybody has a pronator, excuse me, a palmaris longus. So if you pinch your thumb and your, and your pinky finger together, the big tendon that sticks out in the center there is going to be your palmaris longus. I'm missing my left one. Everybody wants to come see it if you don't. If you, does everybody have both of theirs? Yeah. So here's my palmaris longus. Okay. See it? Uh -huh. I've got it. This is way bigger. You got both. You definitely have this one. So extend the wrist a little bit with it. Squeeze hard and extend the wrist. Yeah, I'm not sure if you have one there. That's this right here. Yeah. Right yeah, I think it is. You got them both? So you can see mine right there. Yeah, I'm missing my left one. So this isn't it? No. Is that a scar? Where? I don't know. Is that a, I think that may be a scar. I got scars. <laughs> Papa Roach. <laughs> you guys have them? Yeah. Both of them. So, uh, um, yeah, it, it can limit the amount of tensile flexion that you can create on one side. So people without a palmaris longus may have functionally less strength here. So if they're doing bench press, this wrist may extend more. So it makes it weaker. And about 14% of people are missing a palmaris longus. It's fairly prevalent. Same thing with the peroneus tertius on your leg. And then like roughly three or four percent are missing certain muscles like pec major. Um, yeah. I'll show you a picture in a second of somebody without a pec major. Um, That's something that would be visually... Yeah, for sure. So advantage-wise, somebody without a palmaris longus is less likely to have what? Carpal tunnel syndrome. Because they only have seven tendons that traverse the carpal tunnel instead of eight. So there's more space. <laughs> so most things are kind of gifts and curses, right? All right. So the flexors here, we talked about them before. Biceps brachii, brachialis, brachioradialis. The biceps is the principal supinator of the forearm. The supinator also supinates it, but the biceps brachii has much more mechanical leverage, much more diameter across the sarcomeres and the muscle itself. Uh, the extensor muscles are the triceps and anconius. Anconius is that little teardrop muscle here. 
So it's right there. You'll feel it if you relax the arm. Go just posterior to your radial head and between your olecranon. You feel that real sore, balled up um, area right there? It's got a little teardrop shape. That's your anconius. So oftentimes that's actually what limits your extension. So I want you guys to massage one side on your anconius, and it's going to be sore. Do it for about 20 seconds or so. And I want you to recheck your extension again. And it feels different than any other muscle in the area. This is what a lot of people will call their funny bone. They'll hit their anconius. Technically, like the funny bone, um, not that there's an actual true definition for it, but a lot of people hit their ulnar nerve or they'll hit their olecranon. Am I on the right spot? Like right here? More posterior. <laughs> yep. If you're making that face, that's it. <laughs> You'll know. It feels different than anything else in the area. Here? No, it's going to be between here and here, so it's going to be... There. Oh, okay. Yeah. Feels awful, right? Mm -hmm. Feel a difference in extension? So it's analogous structure in the leg is the popliteus. So, you know, if, if you're having trouble with elbow extension, oftentimes it can be an over tightening coneus muscle. But also, if it's a tight muscle, is a weak muscle, so you will also generate less force with a tightening coneus because you can't create as much force, right? Like when you think about the force creation, if you can only push that far, you can't create as much force because the muscle doesn't have the ability to move through its full range. So a tight muscle is a weak muscle, but also a overly long muscle is a weak muscle as well. They're both weak. They neither produce optimal force production. Okay. The anconius. It's a muscle nobody ever talks about. Uh, medial elbow uh, ligaments and tendons, we have the anterior bundle, the posterior bundle, and the transverse ligament, which attaches the radial head to the humerus as well. So we see that one right there? So it doesn't, so now not every ligament on the body is the same. So your ACL and PCL are very strong taut ligaments, but you also have ligaments like the nuchal ligament, the patellar ligament, that histologically actually look a lot more like tendons. They have a lot more ability to contract and relax and transmit force in a different way. So a, a ligament is defined as a bone to a bone, so the, the tissue between the patella and the, the tubercle on the tibia, it doesn't have the same characteristics as your MCL. You know why? Because it's, a, it's the common attachment point from the quadriceps muscle. So even though it's technically a bone to a bone, and, and people are like, oh, no, it's a ligament, yes, but histologically it resembles a tendon more than it resembles a ligament. And if it histologically does, that means it responds more like a tendon than a ligament as well, which means we're more likely to work on it and get some results out of it, whether it's cross-friction or deep tissue work. Whereas when you press on a true ligament, you're just going to irritate it or, or make it more lax. Another good comparison is the nuchal ligament, which basically you know, is what checks your movement downward like that. But it is a synergistic extensor as well. It does check the full extension there, but it, it can become hypertrophic as well, and it does have histological tendon um, tendencies, tendon tendencies. It's good. It's an accident, but I like it. All right, we're at time. We're good here. So the cubitus valgus and cubitus varus. We have the normal carrying angle of males is about five degrees. Females is going to be between ten to fifteen degrees. That doesn't mean that some males. Again, we talked about our overlapping normal curves. There's going to be some outliers, but in generality, which is kind of how you have to look at it to start with, you're going to see greater carrying angles in females than males. You know. Um, it, like I said, like, there's, there's plenty of women out there in the world that are 6'2", 6'3", that are taller than most males, but the tallest woman is not nearly as tall as the tallest male. I can't remember how tall the tallest female is, 6'8", or 6'9", right now. And the tallest male is like 8'11", or something like that. Like, yeah. Okay, so range of motion. So we have medial rotation, so 0 to 90 degrees. We also have elbow, uh, excuse me, elbow flexion is going to be 0 to 160. So why can't we get 180? Because you're muscle bound, your bicep brachii is in the way. If you moved it out of the way, you could go further. So you can literally be muscle bound. The bigger your biceps is, the less flexion you're capable of creating at your arm. So you're almost arm barring yourself. The only way to take it any further is to extend this part right here, right? Because it's levered. So with somebody with big arms holding a phone here is actually torture because it's like it's like torquing their elbow. I can almost touch my thumb to my shoulder. <laughs> So there, there's no ability to stretch that out. That doesn't work. It's muscle bound. And you'll see it on like bodybuilders and stuff like that. They'll, they'll suffocate themselves when they raise their arms up like that. They can't breathe because their pecs and their traps basically su suffocate them. Right. That's crazy. They have that much muscle. 
So their range of motion is severely limited, not because they're actually inflexible, because there's something in the way. Like their lat's so big that their arm can't come down to their side. That's uncomfortable. Yeah. Most of them have uh, a difficult time breathing. Like, did you guys see the guy, um, did you see the picture of the guy I treated? He's the world's strongest squatter. He's got the world, uh, Ray Ray Williams, he's um, squatted 1,053 pounds with no knee wraps or squat or a suit. He's 5'11", 4'15". And he's got some body fat, but he's got a ton of muscle. So his shoulders are like, like, I'm like, who sits next to that guy on the plane? <laughs> like, he's got to be so uncomfortable because, I mean, he can't squeeze in anymore. His lats are in the way, and when he does, he suffocates himself with his traps. Like, it's a real problem for big people to navigate the world. I always wonder the same thing about people that are like, NBA players are seven foot two. Like, they're getting in the same cars as the rest of us. Like, they're folding themselves in half to get in there. Well, like Shaq, you know, his seat is in the back. Like, his driver's seat is all the way in the back. Right. You know, they have modifications. That right, they have to. But if you don't have that kind of money. Right. And I see somebody who's like 6'8 on an airplane with me, and his knees are like in his face. Yeah. Like, poor guy. Like, it's bad for me, and I'm 5'11", so I don't, I don't know what's going on there. I mean, I have a hard time fitting in the seat. I'm 215, 220. So what does 410 feel like? How uncomfortable, man. Like, all right, so extension, we have 145 to 0. So we can get to full extension, right? In some cases, it's past 0, particularly in women. We think that's also why women are able to fight through arm bars better in jiu-jitsu. But when they don't, there's more damage than a male. Right. You've gone past the, the area of bony resistance, and so there's only ligaments there, so you can completely dislocate them. If you guys have ever seen uh, what Ronda Rousey did to Misha Tate, they pretty much completely dislocated her elbow. But on a male, if you took it any further, you would actually probably break the olecranon. Yeah. The bone would break before anything else because the, the carrying angle. It creates just enough space for the olecranon to move out of the way to where you can actually keep going past neutral. Would be harder to recover. Probably ligamentous. Yeah. Right. Bones, yeah, generally. Ligaments don't often heal as strong as they were before. In fact, most of the time they don't. All right, so pathology of the elbow. So we can have lateral epicondylitis, also known as tennis elbow. The vast majority of tennis elbow are not acquired playing tennis. You can also have acute versus chronic. Those are, you treat them completely separately as well. Medial epicondylitis, so that's on the inside, right? So medial epicondylitis, this is tennis elbow. Excuse me, this is golfer's elbow here. This is tennis elbow here. The, the pathology would be from extension of a backhand. The golfing would be driving the club into the ground, creating strain on the, the medial epicondyle. That's where the names come from. But in actuality, they don't present that way all that often. Sometimes, but not that often. So when you do see a tennis elbow from tennis, it's usually from a different size weight or it's really windy outside or some other load that their muscles and tissues aren't used to. Is it always from a chronic repetitive motion? You can have acute, too. I mean, you, you can even have avulsions of some of these tissues, particularly the medial side, um, especially in teenagers. And, and keep this in mind. Some people in general, their ligaments are stronger than their bones. If you put enough force on a joint, something has to give. Sometimes it's bone, sometimes it's ligament. You don't necessarily know until you get an eval on it. Like I've had a lot of cases where they've you know, dislocated their elbows laterally like that, and until we got the x-ray, we assumed that it was an uh, ulnar collateral tear, but they actually broke off the medial epicondyle, which is actually better. So, all right, so you can have an anconia strain. It's not uncommon for people that do weightlifting. Uh, triceps tendonitis. Also, we could have student elbow, so that's from putting your elbow on the desk. You get electronon irritation. Uh, bone spurring at the electronon process is a consequence of long-term weightlifting. So if you don't keep your triceps long enough and you keep lifting weights or, or pushing on things or doing manual work like this, essentially what happens is your body, it tightens the area up, and so to compensate for that, it's going to extend the bone out, so you're going to have a bone spur on the attachment point. Wool's law, we're yanking on that bone for long enough, your body responds by laying down more bone. The longer that bone spur gets, the less you're going to be able to extend the elbow anymore because now it doesn't fit into the notch anymore. Okay. So you ever seen old guys that lifted weights for a long time? 
They have really pointy elbows and bony elbows. That's because they haven't done a good job of keeping their biceps and triceps loose. They've overused them to the point where basically that, that bone has, has overdeveloped. And then as a consequence of that, because now the bony attachment is different, now they can't engage their tricep the same way. So they can't actually get their tricep to grow the same way because it has a different lever. It's the same thing with somebody with Osgood Schlatter's. When they get a bone spur there that doesn't resolve before they finish growing, now the, the quadricep doesn't attach on the same part anymore. It's, instead of having that hook down here, it's going more flat like that. So that changes the mechanical advantage it has to extend the knee. It also changes the pressure on the kneecap. So instead of having that downward pressure on the kneecap, now it's more of a flatter, right, which allows more motion, which can lead to more grinding and cartilage damage, which is why it's important to actually resolve Osgood Schlatter's when they're teenagers instead of letting it go and letting the bone harden up in that, that abnormal position. It can be resolved before they finish growing, but you have to take the appropriate steps, meaning no stretching, and you've got to do tons of self-myofascial release to take the tension off of that, because if your body doesn't need the tension, it'll reabsorb the bone. It happens to a lesser extent in adults, right? Like osteopenia is a thing. So if osteoporosis and penia is a thing, that means that we can also somewhat get rid of some of our bone spurs as well, right? Just not to the same extent. Can you just Stretching changes the joint angle. So if I'm going to stretch my tricep, for example, I need to, excuse me, I need to bend it this way, and I'm going to, ch I'm going to extend the muscle. So the joint has to change on one side. Self-myofascial release is neurological inhibition. So basically, if my brain perceives my bicep to be this long, and then I press on it here. Now, neurologically, it's going to perceive it to be this long. So neurogenically, it's going to deactivate the central tissue to try to elongate it, even though it's not elongating, so it, it in itself will, will inhibit the middle part of it. So it relaxes the tissue. So if you try to stretch your bicep but it's bound up in the center, all you're going to do is create tension on the bony attachment because this is too tight. You're forcing the motion, right? So once you break this up and then you stretch it, you'll have a good, normal, healthy stretch. So a stretch involves changing the actual angle of the, of the joint to create length in the muscle. Neurogenic inhibition creates length in the muscle through neurological processes, not through actually extending the muscle itself. Your body inhibits it. Similar to like if you were unconscious or under anesthesia. Your muscles are completely inhibited, so there's no tension on them at all. Conversely, if you put somebody on meth, all their muscles are going to tighten up. You ever seen somebody on meth? Uh, yeah. yeah. Eyeballs this big, chewing on their face, real jerky, spastic movements. Right, because it's, it's a... It's a or what you call it? It's a norepinephrine dopamine uh, uh, transmitter uh, agonist. So it basically stimulates or simulates adrenaline. So all that dopamine people like. All right. Almost out of time. Supinators and pronators of the arms. So have, we already talked about this a little bit. We got all these down. Yeah. Saturday night palsy. It's entrapment of the radial nerve on the posterior aspect of the arm. So you can see how, how the radial nerve traverses here. So basically it goes underneath the collarbone. Um, these are trunks, our branches, and then our nerves are finally created as they exit. It goes underneath the humerus and down the back side of the humerus where it wraps around the lateral portion of the elbow. The reason why they call it Saturday night palsy is from falling asleep with your arm on a bar stool and compressing the nerve and then it doesn't work anymore. So your, your radial nerve gives you full extension of the entire posterior chain. So it's an elbow extensor, and it's, an, and it's a wrist extensor. So what you'll see is this floppiness if they have ulnar nerve palsy. They can't extend their wrist at all. Also known as clunkies. Um, so it's usually due to trauma or long-term external compression. I have seen it caused by massage therapists pressing on the radial nerve. Around the, around the back of the humor, sir. Taking a forearm or an elbow and just continually rolling over this. If you're not getting feedback from the patient on what things feel like, if they say it's traveling down or it feels electric, you need to get off that structure. Okay. Carpal tunnel anatomy and syndrome. So the carpal tunnel is an area, it's a literally a tunnel in the flexor component of the hand here. There's eight tendons that traverse it. So you have all of your flexors of your fingers and your wrist, also your palmaris longus. You also have a nerve that goes through the median nerve, and there's also an artery as well. The pathological symptomatology is... is is the transverse carpal ligament basically thickens over time or the tendons thicken over time. So what happens is we get compression of the median nerve. What that does is it causes numbness and paresthesia in those four, three and a half fingers. So the median nerve is going to give you this, 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 and usually half of this. So when somebody has pain in the hand, everybody says they have carpal tunnel. Well, that's not true at all. 
Okay. The other component of this too is it's always going to spare the, the bottom part of the thumb here, so this area will not be numb. The reason why is that that traversing branch right there comes off of the ulnar nerve. It gives you sensation over here. It also supplies muscle tone in your, your adductor muscles, there, so your pinchers. So if you have an ulnar nerve palsy, what you'll actually have is loss of muscle tone here. You'll have atrophy. You would think that that would be a median nerve, but you would be wrong. The median nerve is going to supply flexion, particularly on this side. Tricks of anatomy, right? So you can see here from this view, that's where that median nerve is, so compression. So another thing that could go on here is lunate dislocation or, or subluxation can compress it as well. So I've got AVN of my lunate. I fractured it in college. So there's a dead piece of bone that floats around, and sometimes what happens while I'm treating is it bumps free and it hits my median nerve and my whole arm just goes dead for a second. Every once in a while. But it's temporary, like it's not a big deal. Okay, so this is, this is going to be generally the pattern of carpal tunnel. So one way to really differentiate is to kind of check in there. But there's also an overlap of the dermatomes, which we're going to go over, you know, coming up soon. So we need to differentiate median nerve distribution between C6, C7, and C8. So we know it's either coming from the wrist or the neck or somewhere else. Okay. Bones of the wrist and the hand. So the acronym is some lovers try positions that they can't handle. Anybody ever heard that one? This class, right? <laughs> All right, so scaphoid, lunate, right? Triquetrum, pisiform, trapezoid, um, trapezium, capitate, hamate. So some lovers try pisiforms here, positions that they can't handle. There's other ones too, but that's what I learned. Eventually, you don't want acronyms or you don't want uh, mnemonics, right? You want to just memorize them. But some of these can be confusing, like the trapezoid, trapezium, and triquetrum. Like, really? Right. We need a trapezium and a trapezoid as well? Right. So one way I remember that is the trapezium's under the thumb. See it there? So there's the first metacarpal. Here's the trapezium. The trapezoid is trapped in the middle. And the only two that actually make true articulation are the lunate and the scaphoid. So you can see the triquetrum here. It doesn't actually make uh, an articulation with the ulna, but it does connect via fibrocartilage. So a lot of people have fibrocartilage pain. There's this weird diagnosis out there where people are telling people their ulnas are too long, and they want to shave down their ulnas when they have lateral wrist pain. It's super weird. I've been hearing it a lot lately. So some surgeon decided that that's a thing. Um, so when somebody has lateral wrist pain, they just want to shave down their ulna. The styloid process. It's super weird. So the capitate is the biggest one. It's the captain. So those are some of the ways that I used to try to remember some of these. So the scaphoid is the most fractured carpal bone. The lunate is the most dislocated carpal bone. Um, the pisiform is also often fractured. Uh, the trapezium is involved in thumb arthritis. So the pisiform can be dislocated a lot, too. It's right here, right? So it's a little bump there. So if you fall on an outstretched arm, particularly if you're in wrestling or something like that, it's very common to knock it this way, so superiorly. And that can certainly cause wrist pain as well. So all you have to do is put it back in place, and it does a lot better. Uh, the hamate, the hook of the hamate is often fractured. You're going to see this in golfers and, and baseball players. So they'll hit something. I had a baseball player recently, and you could feel it moving around. So the hook of the hamate, if you feel real hard right there, you'll feel a little bony protuberance. So it's going to be about right there. So it does. it is a hook, and it sticks out. So if you have too much impact on it, you can break it off. You have to have it surgically repaired. Otherwise, it's going to move around and then grind everything up. Okay, pronator teres syndrome. So the pronator teres has two heads, the humeral and ulnar. The median nerve enters the forearm between the two heads of the muscle. Entrapment can mimic carpal tunnel syndrome. Obviously, it's a median nerve. Patients with pronator teres syndrome have numbness in the median nerve distribution with repetitive pronation and supination of the forearm, not flexion or extension of the elbow. So think about the, the pathology or the, the lifestyle of somebody who might have this. Somebody who's a screwdriver often uh, or some other type of pathology like that. What about a chef? Sure. Anything that does pronation, supination a lot, particularly resistant. So my father was one of those people. He is in construction. Um, somebody diagnosed him with carpal tunnel. He had surgery on both wrists. Didn't improve the symptoms because what they do is they cut the transverse carpal ligament there in, in order to free the, uh, the, the median nerve, right? 
But unfortunately, when you cut the transverse carpal ligament, now you've destabilized the wrist because you don't have anything holding it together now. So now your carpal bones move around like crazy, which happened to him because he's still using his wrist a lot. So he developed really bad arthritis in those bones because of all the excessive motion there. So as a result of that, they decided to take two of the bones out and create new articulations in the area. He went to Louisville to see some master hand surgeon. Okay, so after that, what happened was he lost the ability to extend the wrist at all. Right, you, you, you made new joints. Like, of course it's not going to work. These are very complex. Look at all the ranges of motion your wrist can do. You can't just take bones out and expect it to work normal. So now because he couldn't extend his wrist anymore, he couldn't put pressure on it. Also, he lost the viscoelastic properties of the extensors and flexors because the extensors never got flexed. So he was working with the, uh, cro or uh, what you call it? pliers one day, pulling on something and ruptured all the tendons on the posterior aspect of his arm. They all rolled down to here. So then he had to have those surgically reattached there. So he spent about $65,000 out of pocket. By the way, fingers were still numb because it was pronator teres the whole time. The doctor I used to work with, her father had a similar experience where they actually had to do a graft, a skin graft, because the guy's skin started dying, and he ended up having to lose one of his fingers. He had a finger amputated from a, from a carpal tunnel surgery that led to all these other issues. Which, by the way, it's a ligament, right? Which means you can stretch it. It's a very simple carpal tunnel stretch I'm going to teach you guys. It's very effective. And if you, if you don't have somebody to actually open the carpal tunnel that way, these work pretty good at flossing the nerve. Also, these work pretty good at flossing the nerve as well. You just put your elbow against the wall and lean with your head into it. You're going to floss the median nerve right through that area. So do, do 15 of those right now, and then I want you to recheck your, your sensation in your fingers relative to the other side. And if you can turn your hand all the way up, which I can't because I'm muscle bound, do it that way. Okay. Now check your fingertips compared to the other side. The difference in sensation. So you can have subtle nerve and vascular entrapments and not really even notice it. You may be number than you think you are. Okay, so EMG may show only mildly reduced conduction velocity. So an EMG is electromyography. That's one of the ways that we measure nerve conduction. Um, so early fatigue in the forearm muscles is seen with repetitive stressful motion, especially parnation. And uh, we'll finish this one up next time. Go home, get some rest. Absorb all the things that I said. And don't ever forget any of them. <laughs> <laughs>